convert to reduction today. And it has things on it. Like the other guy mentioned. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I did kind of the bigger this in the first class. Oh, it's because we're pulling. I did. I'm not. The pull of the cable. Yeah. I am today. I am now. I'm going to finish that chapter today. I'm going to do two, the two substitutions today. Two or three, whatever. Okay, now, where is there more heat removed from? As you go from the gas to the liquid, or as you go from the liquid to the solid? As I have shown in that picture. The gas to liquid. Okay, the gas to liquid. So, this is called the heat of vaporization. So, this thing here, from here to here. This is called heat of vaporization. And this from here to here is called heat of fusion. Okay, now what's this thing here called? Heat of melting? No. This is called heat of fusion, and this is called heat of vaporization. It doesn't matter if you are going from the liquid to the solid or the solid to the liquid, the number, the numerical value for that will be the same. This is the way you, you write this. This is heat of vaporization, and this is heat of fusion. Heat of vaporization is always greater than heat of fusion. It always takes more energy to make something go from the liquid to the gas because in the gas phase, the molecules are very separate from each other, meaning you separated or you broke all intermolecular interactions. You guys, you paying attention or not? You are? What did I just say? Heat of vaporization greater than heat of fusion. Why? Because the gas molecules are more inside the Because I, you, in the gas phase, you have completely separated the molecules, yes? yes? As you go from a solid to a liquid, did you completely separate them? No. no. You distance them from each other, but you did not separate them. Okay? So, I'm going to talk about this right now, even though this is not the place and the time, but. As you go from a solid to a liquid, does that require energy for that process to occur, or does that release energy? From a solid to a liquid? It requires energy, right? That's why you have to do what? To make a solid go to a liquid? Heat it. So from a solid to a liquid, this process is endothermic. If it is endothermic, this delta H number is going to be positive or negative? Positive. It's going to be positive. So delta H, I'm going to say delta H positive. Mm -hmm. If you go from a liquid to a gas, is that process, does that process require energy? Does yes. it release energy? Requires. It requires energy. So that process is also endothermic. So the delta H would be also positive. If you go from solid to liquid, that's called delta H of what? of fusion. That's what it's called. Okay, It could be called delta H of melting. It could be called delta H of freezing, but it's not. It's called delta H of fusion and delta H of vaporization. Only two of them. From here to here, this is called delta H of vaporization. If you go from a gas to a liquid, from a gas to a liquid, that require energy. As you go from a gas to a liquid, what does that do? It releases energy, so this process is exothermic. So the delta H for this would be negative. It will be the same number, but negative. Okay? It will be the same number as the delta H of fusion, but now with a negative sign. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And from liquid to solid, that process will be also exothermic. Meaning that when a liquid or a gas is becoming a gas is becoming a liquid, 
there is a release of energy. Did you guys know that? Did you did you know that? I think it's kind of intuitive. So when water is condensing, okay, it was vapor, and when it's condensing, what is it doing? It is releasing energy. Okay. So what is better to do? Stick your hand in boiling water, or have your hand in steam. What would burn you better? Steam will burn you better. Not only because steam could be at a higher temperature. Okay, steam could be at, let's say, instead of 100, water will boil at 100, yes? Mm -hmm. So can the temperature of boiling water ever be 104? It can't be 104. Well, it could be if you added some stuff. Next chapter, okay? But pure water. The boiling point is 100. So when you stick your hand in boiling water, the maximum temperature in there is... 100. Mm -hmm. And if you stick your hand in steam, the temperature could be 120. So, but not only that, so when you stick your hand in there, the water is going to do what on the surface of your skin? Because your skin is colder. The water is going to condense on your skin. And when it condenses, what is it going to do? It's going to release energy. Okay? So, a hurricane gets some of its energy from that. Okay? The water goes into the atmosphere because it's, the ocean is hot and it has a vacuum. The water goes into the atmosphere as a gas and when it gets up there very high, the temperature is lower. So what happens to, the, to that gas water? It condenses. And when it condenses, what does it do? Release energy. And where does this energy go? In a hurricane. <laughs> Have you ever been in a hurricane? Mm -hmm. Have you? I mean, it's Miami. We don't have hurricanes here, right? We haven't had one in a long time. Some of you were babies the last time there was a hurricane here. Anyway, uh, most of the time a hurricane is not cold, yes? A hurricane is hot. You felt it? You feel the heat? No? <laughs> you mean you guys don't go in the, go in the rain in the hurricane? <laughs> What's wrong with you people? You stay inside the house and pray and stuff, don't you? <laughs> There's nothing more fun but go in a hurricane. Go swimming. All right, so that's a heating curve, that's a cooling curve. This thing here is called a phase diagram. And you will never know what this diagram shows you. Hmm? What does this diagram show you? Phase changes, yes, or phases. So here's how this looks. side we're going to have temperature and on this side we are going to have pressure. Very easily you have to know things from this diagram. Simple things like this. Three lines meet here, yes? So this is called the triple point. And at the triple point all three faces are at equilibrium. Write it down. At the triple point, all three phases are at equilibrium. Now, this point up here is called the critical point. And if you are critical in the hospital, what's happening to you? Dying. You are going to die. So obviously, a substance is not going to die. The substance is going to do what? stop being itself, yes? So at the critical point after that, the substance will no longer behave as a liquid. It will no longer behave as a gas. It will behave like a mixture of them. It's called a supercritical fluid. 
It might have the density of a liquid and flow like a gas. Yeah. What's an example of that? It has many substances undergo. Has to be very high pressures and temperatures. Like what type of temperature? I don't know. It depends on the substance. 500, 600, 1,000. I don't know. What you say called? Supercritical fluids. You can Google it if you want to know more about this stuff, and then teach us maybe next class. But you said that it's not working. It behaves like both of them. So it has a density of a liquid, and it flows like a gas. Have you ever seen a gas flowing? How fast does it flow? The gas goes very slow. The gas is very fast. Okay, very fast. But it has very, very low density, so when it hits you in your face, nothing happens to you. But if it had the density of a liquid and that thing hits you in your face, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have holes in it. Okay? So that's what a supercritical fluid is. It's special. It has special uh, solubility properties. Okay? People use it to do things. Okay. This here, at the lowest temperature, what's the face you expect? Solid. And then after that? Liquid. And after that? Gas. And the gas is which part, guys? The gas is all of this, yes? The gas is all of this. So as you start heating a substance at a certain pressure, it first goes here and then goes there. This here is an equilibrium point. All the points on this line are equilibrium points between the two neighboring things, yes? All the points here in this line are equilibrium points. All of these are equilibrium points. This is an equilibrium point from solid to liquid. That has a name, and the name is, what's the name? Hello? When you go from the solid to the liquid, it is called melting, yeah? It's called melt. So, this here is a melting point, and this melting point corresponds to a temperature, and it also corresponds to what else? A specific pressure. And what's this point right here? What's this one called? Another equilibrium point called melting point. It is at a different pressure. How about this? One? You never get this one. What's that one called? Melting point. Melting point. In fact, the way they built this line was by finding the melting point at the different what? Pressure. At the different pressures. Very nice. There is a special pressure, and that is 1 atm. And it is special because that is the pressure we are in, yes? Sea level, that is standard pressure. So at 1 atm, this is what happens at 1 atm. At 1 atm, there is an equilibrium point here. What is that equilibrium point called? Huh? Melting point. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. But it is a special melting point because it is at 1 atm. It is so special that they call it normal. So when you are normal, you are special. Because you are just like everybody else. So whenever something occurs at 1 atm, what is that called? Normal, whatever it is. Now, what's this called here? Normal, because it is at 1 atm. And this is a phase transition between liquid to gas. to gas. So this is called normal. Normal what? Boiling point. Boiling point. Very good. Okay. How about this one? Right here. What's this? It's a boiling point. Is it called the normal boiling point? No. No. So what is it called? The abnormal? This is just a boiling point. It's not abnormal. It's just not normal. And not normal means you are special too. Okay. In this diagram, does it show you a normal sublimation point? No. There is no normal sublimation point. This here is what point? 
the point in which it goes from the solid to the gas. Yes, this is all a gas. So this is called a sublimation point, yes? But it doesn't have any normal sublimation point. For the substance. What happened? For the substance. Yeah, for the substance, obviously. Some substances don't look like this. Some substances only have a normal sublimation point, like CO2. If you look in your slides, I gave you an example of it. What else? What's happening at the triple point? Everybody is together, yes? Solid, liquid, or gas, everybody's going to be happy for the rest of their lives. Equilibrium means it is a phase transition, OK? Are there any substances with a normal triple point? No. Water gets close to it, but no. So hey, I'm going to give you an MCAT question. You guys are interested in MCAT question? Yep. Because you're not taking the MCAT, you're not interested, right? Right? If you're not taking the MCAT, you're not interested, how about the PCAT? Yes. yes. Now you're interested? <laughs> Okay, this is for the MCAT, PCAT, or the whatever cat. This is A, B, C, and D. This question showed in the MCAT many years ago when I was a baby, I think. Okay? And the question was, which of the following is a phase diagram for water? So the question was, which was the phase diagram for water? Which one do you think? C? Absolutely not. By the way, none of the phase diagrams look like C. None of the phase diagrams look like that. Okay. I tried making this point up, but I couldn't get it right, right? I tried making this straight up. It's not straight up. It's slanted to the right a little bit, okay? So the phase diagram for water is this one, okay? So you write it down. Phase diagram for water is this one. It's not because you have to know for the MCM. You have to know for my class. This is a phase diagram for water. This thing here sloping what side? To, to the left, yes? yes? And the reason why it goes to the left is because ice or solid water has a lower density than liquid water. So ice is less dense than liquid water. That is why it goes to the left. Why? And this here, since all substances are more dense than their liquids when they're in the solid state, it goes to the, it goes to the right. None of them straight up, and this is, I don't know what this is, right? <laughs> Looks like somebody was sitting down and their pants broke. You were asking why what? Why is the density of ice lower than the density of water? You don't know? Google it. <laughs> Whenever you have a question like that, just Google it. It'll save us time, okay? This is a topic of the next class, of the next chapter, but I'll show you. The arrangement for water to form, okay? This hexagonal arrangement for this, for the solid to form. You've got to have six water molecules with their hydrogen bonds at a specific distance. You have six on this side, and then six on the other side, and six on the other side, so on and so forth. Hexagonal, yes? Six of them. And when it's liquid water, they are like this. Yes? This requires more space than this does. As a result, the volume is larger, the density is lower.
Yes? Yep. Okay. All right. Now, if this is if this is a phase diagram for water, and this is a phase diagram for what is this a phase diagram for? Everything else. And this is a phase diagram for water. This is why it was a fair question to ask which is a phase diagram for water, because there is only one, and it's this one. So this is for water, while everything else looks like that. Okay? And I already explained to you why. So let's say you are at, at a certain temperature. Let's say you are at this temperature right here. And let's say this is a temperature of whatever, ice. And if I increase the pressure, what happens? This is the same temperature, yes? This here is temperature, that's pressure. I increase the pressure. What happens? What happens here? <coughs> if I increase the pressure at the same temperature, this solid here, solid, undergoes a phase transition in which it goes from solid to liquid, only by applying pressure to that ice. Okay? So this is the reason why you can skate on ice. Have you seen ice skates before? Mm -hmm. You have? There's no ice in Miami. Um, right? But I've you're not from Miami, are you? I've never seen ice. Okay. So it's not that great. It's not that good? Okay. All right. So, if you are skating on ice, the blade is very sharp. Sharp. Okay. I mean, not sharp. I don't know if it is. It sharp like a knife? Yeah. Sharper. Yeah. <laughs> it's, really sharp. it's sharper than a knife. Oh yeah. You're serious? So you can go like that to somebody and cut it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. So it's sharp like the like a knife. Let's say. And when you stand on it, all your small amount of weight from all the burgers you have been being, eating, right, all these years, all that weight is going to land on a very small space. And what that is going to do, it is going to increase the pressure of that ice. And what happens is it melts. And when it melts, it stays in that slit. And that is a lubrication for you to slide on that ice. So you are really not skating on ice. You are skating on water. water. Because as you skate, the bottom of your skates, the ice is melting, so it's becoming water, and that's how you skate on it. You like that, don't you? Yeah. Sounds like walking on water. Because you're a fire, you skate faster. If what? If you're like heavier, you skate faster. Yeah. <laughs> and you can be stopped. Right? <laughs> Once you acquire all of that in inertia, inertia. Is it called inertia? Something like that. If you take in physics, yes? First law of Newton mechanics. Nobody can stop you. <laughs> Alright guys. I think that's the end of that chapter. Any questions? Can you just uh, quickly repeat the delta, the change of uh, delta H of vapor and delta H of fusion? I was kind of in the process. Delta H of what? Uh, vapor and fusion, like you were talking about the difference. The difference? Delta H of fusion is when you go from a solid to a liquid, liquid. Okay. and that is always a positive number. And if you go from a liquid to a gas, that's called delta H of vaporization. That is always a? Positive. Positive number two. Okay. But if you are doing the reverse of either vaporization or fusion, it's the same number but with a negative, negative. negative sign. Mm -hmm. Which of those two has a higher boiling point? Yeah. 
right. Which one? CA4. CA4 or CF4? Okay, let's say you're saying C, let's say you say CI4. Why? Molecular weight. Molecular weight. And you can only compare molecular weight if what? They're both non-polar. If they are both what? Non-polar. Non-polar. Are they both non-polar? Don't look at me, just look yes. at the compound. Yes. My, the answer is not in my face. Yes, they are both non-polar. This is non-polar because this has four of the same ones. Your confusion could be, well, fluorine is more electronegative than iodine, so this will have a, a higher dipole. It will, but this is symmetrical, so they all cancel out. So this has a higher molecular weight. They're both non-polar. This has the higher boiling point. Yes? Yep. Let's go to the next chapter, my friends. What time is this class over? Time is flying, huh? Right? No? If it's long, it's because you don't like the class. If it's short, that's because you love the class. That's what happens with your boyfriend, yeah? You're like, damn, when is he going to leave? <laughs> oh, baby, go home. You need to rest. <coughs> Because you don't like your boyfriend. All right. That's good. Next chapter is called. What's the next chapter called? Uh, you mean to say nobody looked at what else we were doing? Now you're reading it. That doesn't count. The purpose is not to trick me. I'm not your boyfriend, okay? All right. So the next chapter is called solutions, okay? We did intermolecular forces, and now we're talking about solutions. We're going to talk about a solution. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh yeah, that's a nice solution? You ever heard of it? No? You don't get out much, do you? Turn them down, you know. <laughs> Discourage them. All right. A solution is a solution is a homogeneous mixture. I don't remember in 1045 if I talked about homogeneous mixture or not. Did I? Yeah. No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. Right. Well, maybe I just know from intro. Okay, homogeneous means it is the same all throughout. Heterogeneous mean, means it has varying composition. It varies. Composition varies. So if you have a homogeneous mixture, that is a, a mixture is a physical combination of two or more substances. Mixture, physical combination of two or more substances. Homogeneous mixture means that that physical combination, you can only see one thing in there. Okay? So if you get salt, a teaspoon of salt and you add it to a bucket of water, can you see the salt in there? No. No, that is a homogeneous mixture. Mm -hmm. It has two substances, salt and water. You can only see one. And if you put a teaspoon of sugar in a bucket of water, what happens to that sugar? It's dissolved. Are you okay? Are you sick? <laughs> no? You tired? You haven't said a word. You haven't laughed. You haven't made conversation with anybody else. It's so weird. I'm worried about you. <laughs> so, if, if you get sand and you put it in water, what would that be? Would oh. that be homogeneous? No. The sand will sink all the way to the bottom. That will be heterogeneous. And I did talk about it in 1045. If you don't know it, it's because... <coughs> That's 1025? Yeah. You just said that sand, was like, sand is very polar. Yeah. Yeah. So, what depends on what type of sand. It's no, if there was only one type of sand. If, if it's a bigger grain, then it won't, it won't, it won't dissolve. If it's smaller. No. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what size of grain you got on that sand, it will never dissolve. You can pass it through the little thing where you crush it, and it will st still not dissolve. Because to your eyes is small, but to the water is not. 
to the water is very big. So all sand, as far as the water is concerned, is very big, cannot go inside solution. But if you had one silicon dioxide, but you don't have one silicon dioxide, it would dissolve. Yes, but that doesn't exist because they make long chains. So, a, a solution is a homogeneous mixture, okay? So, two things, and when you look at it, there is only one. The one present in the slowest amount is called solute. So, when you have a mixture, a homogeneous mixture, you're going to have one that is in lower amount, solute, that is, uh, let's not say smaller amount, yes? let's say lower amount and the solvent is the other thing that it's in there and that is the one in higher. higher amounts this amount is by moles most of the time okay even though I am not going to ask you to calculate the moles you can just see it from the grams but it's not in grams it's in moles which one is there more particle of particles of Okay. Now, some of you, because you guys are like that, are wondering, what, what, if, what if they're the same amount? I don't know. <laughs> they're both the same amount? They're both called solvents? I have no idea. Okay. They're both called solute? I don't know. You're not going to have that. You're going to have one that is lower and one that is higher. One is going to be called the solute. The other one is called the solvent. Now for a, and this is, this is what a solution is, yes? Now for a solution to form, there are things that need to happen. And the things that need to happen are, let's say, let's say you put a solid in, in a liquid, okay? Let's say the solid is, sodium chloride and let's say the liquid is water. In order for this to occur, in order for the solid to dissolve in this liquid, what needs to happen? When you put the solid inside of the liquid, you're putting this in it, yes? And in order for this to dissolve, what needs to happen to this? It can dissolve like this, right? It has to kind of break it down. Dissociate is a good word too. So yes, what needs to happen is this interaction between these two need to break. And that is called solute, solute interaction need to break. So you are breaking solute, solute interactions. <coughs> what else are you breaking? Water. You are breaking water, water. So solvent, solvent interactions. So solute-solute interactions and solvent-solvent interaction, is this process endothermic or exothermic? Exothermic. <coughs> huh? Excuse me? Endothermic. How do you know? Phase change. Because what? Yeah, I told you, but how do you know? Because I told you it's not a big You had to know why, because when you forget what I told you, then what? Then you need me, right? You gotta go look for me, right? I'm not gonna be here forever. I plan to die within the next couple of years. So, solute solute interaction, you are breaking intermolecular forces, yes? And whenever you break something, you must pay for it, yes? You ever gone to a store and broke things? You gotta pay for them, okay? So, if you break intermolecular forces, you are separating them, right? That requires energy. So, this process is. Endothermic. In order for you to separate forces of attraction, you need to apply energy, guys, right? Hello? Yes. Yes. Are you guys a mute clutch? Huh? You guys mute? So if you break solvent solver interaction, what's that? Endothermic or exothermic? Endothermic. 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 In order for you to separate these water molecules, you have to overcome how much they like each other. Okay? And that's a normal thing in life, yes? 
And now, after you break solute-solute interaction, and after you break solvent-solver interaction, now you are going to make something, yes? So now you are going to form something. And that that you are going to form is called solute-solvent interactions. Oh, I forgot to put solvent here. So solute-solvent interactions. Why are you guys staring at the board? I'm saying it. Solute solvent interaction. Write it down. This is what you are going to form. Solute solvent interactions. Is that going to release energy or is that going to require energy? Require it. It's going to require. If you make attract forces of attraction, it's going to require energy. So for you to be attracted to your boyfriend, someone forced you? Is that what you say? <laughs> he forced you? <laughs> I don't get it. No, it just happens by pushing the other molecule, so it has to be accelerated. Yeah, whenever you make, guys, if you, if you separate things that like each other, that requires energy, yes? If you bring together things that like each other, I cannot require energy again, right? It releases energy, right? That's what happens. That's why there are sparks when you see your boyfriend. All this kind of stuff. So you are making solute-solvent interaction, and this process is exothermic. So how many steps were here? There were three steps for a solution to form. So the enthalpy of solution, S-O-L-N, has three steps. Delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3. This is what is happening. For one of them, and this is in no particular order, right? You are breaking for the first one solute-solute interaction. You are breaking for the second one solvent-solvent interaction. And for the third one, what are you doing? You are making solute-solvent interaction. The first two steps are endothermic, while the last step is exothermic. So depending on the value of these numbers, you might have a delta H of solution that is either a negative number, meaning exothermic, or you can have a delta H of solution depending on the values that is positive, meaning endothermic. In general, an endothermic solution will require energy, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Now, where does this energy come from? The, the energy could come from the surroundings, but if it is too high, can it come from the surroundings? No. If this number is too high, it does not come from the surroundings. Okay? Now, if it is exothermic, in general, it will take place, okay? If it releases energy, it will want to do it. If it's endothermic and this number is too big, it will not occur. Okay? If this number is somewhat small, 30, 40 kilojoules per mole, it will occur at room temperature. Okay? There is something called the rule of like dissolves like. You getting all of this in the camera? Oh, man, this guy forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the rule of like dissolves like, and I have already talked about this, I was provoked before. Like dissolves like says that molecules that are alike dissolve in each other, and molecules that are not alike, they do not dissolve in each other. How silly is that? So let's say I have water and ammonia. Are they alike? Yes. So the question is, are they polar? Are they non-polar? What are they? Polar. This is polar. This is polar. So they are both polar. So they do what? They dissolve. And H2O and wood alcohol, are they both polar? Yes or no? Yes. They are polar, so they dissolve in each other.
Let's say that and water. Does that dissolve in each other? No. Nope. They do not dissolve in each other. They do not dissolve because water is polar and this is non polar. So, no big deal, right? Does this dissolve? <coughs> Sodium chloride, does that dissolve in water? Yes. yes. Okay. This is a weird example, right? In which this is ionic. ionic. This is not polar. This is more than polar, which is called ionic. It still dissolves in water, okay? Because water is very polar. Okay? Now, if you start to have ionic compounds with something that is a little bit less polar than this, most of the time it doesn't dissolve. But I'm not going to trick you, okay? Let's say I tell you this on the test. Let's say I tell you that that potassium iodide dissolves in that. What are the intermolecular forces, the strongest intermolecular forces present in there? Hydrogen bonding. Hello? Okay, yeah, this is ionic, yes? So ion, and this is polar, so the strongest forces in there are called ion dipole forces. Okay? Yes or no? So this ion dipole is the strongest. Yeah, ion dipole is the strongest of the intermolecular forces. Yes. Okay. I don't know why I've written down ion ion is the strongest. Ion ion is the strongest, but we we established before that ion ion, in some people, is not the first intermolecular force. Oh, okay. So. But yes, ion ion is the strongest of the ones that I wrote on the board, yes? And where would hydrogen bonding be? Like in it would be ion ion, mm -hmm. ion dipole, then dipole dipole, then hydrogen bond dipole dipole, and then non hydrogen bond dipole dipole. So would it be salt? What? So would it be salt? The ion, the. I told you, if it dissolves, what are the forces? Okay. I will kind of do yeah. If this dissolves, sometimes I tell you, and sometimes I don't tell you. I won't tell you when you can know it. Uh, this one, for example, let's say I tell you it dissolves. What type of intermolecular forces are present? Not ion dipole. That one is not polar. It's left. Okay. So that this molecule is polar, yes? So yeah. that's called dipole. a dipole. And this is non-polar. This is called induced dipole. So the strongest intermolecular forces there are called dipole induced dipole. Does it dissolve? Yes. Now, I won't give you things that are lies on the test, yes? So this, for example, now you have to know it, right? Because I told you that this one dissolves, yes? Or if I tell you this dissolves, even if it doesn't, what is the primary force in there? But there are amounts to this, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean all of it dissolves in all of it, of the other stuff. Solubility has a certain degree, okay? Now we're going to do that next. So, if I tell you this dissolves in that, then that's what it is, yes? But normally, when you look at this, you'll go, this is non-polar, yes? Mm -hmm. So, if I were to tell you this, I2, does it dissolve in H2O? No. No. I2 and H2O, they do not dissolve in each other, okay? Because this is non-polar, and this is polar. So the rule of like dissolves like says, if this is non-polar and this is polar, they do not like each other, they do not dissolve. That's one type of question. That's what I expect you to know. Determine non-polar from polar. And then I will give you one that doesn't matter how weird it looks. I tell you it dissolves. What are the forces that make this happen? Yeah. When it dissolves, what do you say first? What? 
when it resolves, what did you say the force that comes on is? Is there a force that dissolves? Yeah, there is. It depends on what they are. The forces can be ion induced dipole, they could be ion uh, dipole forces, could be dipole dipole forces, could be London dispersion force, it could be any combination. What else? I think we're going to have a test. If I finish this chapter by Thursday, today is Tuesday, yes? Yeah. We're going to have a test on Thursday of next week. You have been studying, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is the summer. It's not time for you to get a tan. Okay, it is time for you to do what? Study for my class. Did you go to the beach this week? Huh? You? Me? Yeah? No, not this week. Okay. <laughs> I went to the beach. I went looking for some of you, but I couldn't find that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the amount that dissolves in the other substance, sometimes it's little, sometimes it's a lot. It is a certain amount, and that is called a concentration. Now, the amount that dissolves has a name concentration and it uses different units, okay, with different ideas. So, let's say we are going to talk about mass-related concentrations, okay? Mass-related concentrations. You have things like percent by mass. And the formula for percent by mass, I think you had this formula before. In lab, I think you used it. It is mass of component divided by total mass times 100. That's why it has this percent here. So let's say you have 20 grams of sugar in 200 grams of, let's not use the same, 20 grams of sugar in 500 grams of water. What will go on the top? 20 grams of sugar, and down here, over water. Total mass, which is? The sugar. Sugar. Water. The sugar plus the water, yes? So 520 times 100. Can you find the percent by mass of the water? Yes. Yes, you can find it. It's 500 divided by 520. The addition of all the components and their percentage must add up to what number? To 100, yes? The addition of the percent of all components must add up to 100. PPMs is another mass concentration, and PPM stands for parts per million, and it is